Now that we know a little bit about the idea of differentiation and the kind of problems that it can help us solve, we're going to move on to what is essentially the reverse idea, integration, and the kind of things that it can help us solve and all the different types of methods and techniques that we can learn to help us carry out the process of integration. So we're going to start off by talking about the integral of a function. Before we get right into it, just a bit of a motivation here, and we'll see more problems as we work through the videos and lectures. Various real world problems can be thought of as accumulation problems, or collection, or summing up, or bringing things together. Something like when we do, uh, do work by a force moving something from place to place. Well, if the force is constant and there's no real complications going on, it's just a multiplication of some numbers. But if we have a variable force applied, which is quite often the case, then we need a stronger, a more robust method to look at these sorts of problems. And finding things like centers of mass, um, centers, centers of mass of heterogeneous ob objects, things that are not the same all the way through. Um, it's not just a geometric average, it's, it's actually more complicated than that. And we need techniques that basically bring us to the idea of an integral. So what exactly is this, this integral thing? Basically, you can think about it as being the opposite of a derivative. Integration is like the opposite process uh, to differentiation. So that means when we're trying to find what an integral is for some given function, we need to think of this kind of question. What function was it that got differentiated to give the function that I'm looking at? And we're going to do some questions just like that uh, for the rest of this video. Now, not surprisingly, this idea, or this, this question, gives rise to the terms antiderivative and anti-differentiation, you know, just basically meaning undo it, or doing it the opposite way. Um, and the good thing is that knowing your rules for differentiation is going to give you a big help when you're trying to do antiderivatives, because it's basically just reversing them, or looking backwards on your tables, looking in the opposite direction on a set of rules. And being able to do that is going to help you a lot when you're doing integrals. So let's check out some examples now. It's probably actually worthwhile trying to do these yourselves, but let me just give you the intro to what I want you to do. So it says here, find the antiderivatives of the functions. So that means, if you think back to our question that we highlighted here, what function was it that got differentiated to give the function shown? So in other words, what function was differentiated to give the result 3x squared? And so on down the rest. So why don't you pause, have a crack at these yourself, and see how you go finding the antiderivatives of those three functions. Okay, so I've asked myself what function, when differentiated, would give me 3x squared. Remember when we differentiate polynomials, or powers of x, we always decrease the power by 1. So if I wanted to undo a differentiation for a function like 3x squared, I'd need to increase that power by 1. So I'd be looking at some function like x to the 3, increasing the power by 1. So let's just think, what happens if I differentiate that? 3 comes out the front, and my x becomes x squared. And in this case, fantastic, I've actually got the exact function that I want. So I can say here that the antiderivative of 3x squared is x cubed. In other words, the function which differentiates to give 3x squared is x cubed. And we can do the same for the rest of them as well. So, for example, in b, we've got f of x equal to cos x. So I need to say to myself, what function differentiates to give cos of x? Well, remember, sine x and cos x cycle between each other in differentiation. So the derivative of sine x is, well, basically from your rules, it's cos x. So this tells me that antiderivative is just sine x. And then the final question, part c, asks us to do 3 times x plus 1 all, th all squared. Now this one's a bit harder, but it's not too bad. If I think about it as if I have some sort of function to the power 2, I probably would have used the chain rule to differentiate and get something like that. So it probably came from a third power of the same function. So something like x plus 1 to the 3 maybe. So I can do a bit of a guess and check here. I think what would have happened if I differentiated this using the chain rule? Well, I would have put the 3 out the front, 
written the x plus 1 again but to a lower power, and then multiplied by the derivative of the inside, which here is just 1. So in fact, well, it's exactly what I was looking for. So I can say that the antiderivative then is x plus 1 all cubed. It's sort of a guess and check, I guess. Anyway, that's the idea of antiderivatives. You're looking for the function which would differentiate and give you a function that you are shown. Well, it turns out any other number added to the end of these functions, our antiderivatives, any other constant added to the end would still differentiate and give us the same function. So think sine x plus 2. If I differentiate that, the 2 goes away and I still get cos x. If I had x plus 1 to the 3 plus 407, for example, the derivative of 407 is 0, and I still hit back at f of x equal to that same function. So all of the antiderivatives in the example could have had constants added to them and still been correct. Any constant, in fact. Gives, to, gives us a, a family of antiderivatives of a function. And we call that, uh, that result, when we include the possibility of a constant, the indefinite integral of a function. So indefinite integrals and antiderivatives are very, very, very closely related. The main difference is that we just allow for the fact that we can add any constant we want to the end. So what we do when we write these things, instead of having to write antiderivative all the time, we write it as this funny looking thing here, which is an integral symbol, and say the integral of f of x, this little thing called a differential, we say with respect to x, is equal to the antiderivative function plus c, where c can be any constant we like. And that's what we mean when we say an indefinite integral. So it might be worth pausing for just a second, having a look at that symbolic representation one more time and labeling a few of the pieces on it. You need to become familiar with what these things are labeled as. So the one out the front, the thing that looks like a really long s, is called the integral sign. And it's just read as integral of, or the integral of, or integrate. The thing on the inside, the function, is referred to as the integrand. That's the thing that will be integrated. The function that we're trying to integrate. Or the function that we're trying to find what was differentiated to get to. And then finally the dx part. That's a differential and it just basically tells you what variable to differentiate, or sorry, to integrate with respect to. So there's those three key parts. A little bit later on we'll see this picture again and we'll see some extra stuff floating in. So we'll be labeling a few more things that appear in integrals. So to finish it off, let's just try a few with this new, new, new notation in them. So first up, we've got the integral of x to the 4 plus 3 with respect to x. And it works exactly the same way as finding the antiderivatives. We have to think what function was differentiated to give x to the 4. Well, it would be a 1 higher power, x to the 5. But then we need to make sure that when we differentiate that, we don't end up with another number out the front because the derivative of x to the 5 is 5x to the 4, we need to divide by 5, so that there's no 5 over here. A constant 3, well that would have come from 3 times x. The derivative of 3x is just 3. And then we add in at the end the possibility that any other constant whatsoever would still be a correct result. Our integration constant. And the second one, the integral of 2 times cos of t, this time with respect to t. So notice that it's just telling us there's a different variable, and that's what we need to integrate with respect to. Cos would have come from uh, differentiation of sine, and there's a constant out the front, so that can just be left there, just like you would with derivatives. So we would have 2 times sine of t, plus any constant we like. You can always check these things by differentiating back again. So the derivative of 2 sine t with respect to t would be 2 cos t, and the derivative of c is 0. So we have 2 cos t as our result. So that's how we find indefinite integrals uh, in simple cases. We will be seeing much more complicated functions to integrate and different methods to work on them in the, in the subsequent videos. But for now, you might want to check out the first section of Chapter 5 in the text, or in other texts, just check out any section that introduces the idea of antiderivatives and indefinite integrals. And you can start to attempt some of the exercises from the worksheets or the text.